Okay, let's start. Good afternoon, all. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Claude Tadonki. He has been collaborating with us in research projects and event organization. He is a senior researcher and lecturer at Min Paritech Institute, working on cutting edge research in high performance computing, parallel computing, operational research, matrix computation, combinatorial algorithm, and complexity. Uh, Professor Claude Tadonki was, has worked at several laboratories and universities. He has initiated various scientific projects and national international collaborations. He's an active member of well-established scientific corporation and has published numer numerous papers in journals and international conference. It's a great pleasure to have you here in our workshop. And on top of being a distinguished researcher, Claude loves Brazil and it's almost a Carioca guy. Today he's very African, but his soul is Carioca. I'm sure about it. So, uh, Claude, you can share now your presentation, and I will ask everyone who wants to make questions that write the questions on the chat, then we can read for Claude in the end of his presentation. Claude, thank you very much for, for being here with us. Okay. Eu vou começar em português. Boa tarde. Não sei que hora está agora no Brasil. É sempre um prazer para mim fazer qualquer coisa com o Brasil, colaboração e curtir também o país, a cultura, as pessoas. Muito obrigado por esta ocasião, por este convite. É... Well, I will switch to English now. I will do my presentation in English, but uh, for those who want to ask questions in Portuguese, I can understand and answer in Portuguese or in English. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, parallel combinatorial optimization. So it's a focus on parallel combinatorial optimization um, because this is a topic very important because if we are building a supercomputer because there is a need and it's important to understand what kind of need do we have with supercomputer or with parallel computing in general. And um, combinatorial optimization is, according to me, but this is well known, uh, a topic where you can find interesting problem, but problem that are also difficult to solve. Difficult in sense of the complexity, not necessarily in sense of the method. We know how to solve them. But the problem is, is that those methods that we can use to solve the problem uh, require a lot of computing time. So for this reason, if you want to reduce uh, the computing time, then parallel computing is one way to go, at least from the computer science point of view. So this is uh, what I'm going to, to, to talk about today and give you an overview of this uh, focus. What are the direction, what are the problem, what has been done, and give you also a short view of my recent research on this topic, which was trying to design parallel uh, programming method for shared memory machine related to a parallel uh, combinatorial optimization paradigm. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, some basic cases. The first case that I have to show to you is what is called airline crew pairing problem. So the problem here is the company, the airline company has a certain number of flight and people who has to manage the flight, stewards, pilots, and each member is assigned to a given flight. So the problem is first, the constraint is that each flight need to have the full staff. And the cost of this assignment, of the cost of the reducing uh, the, the resulting schedule has to be minimal. This is for the company to save money. Here on the left, you can see, but this is just an example, how this problem can be written in the form of a mathematical programming problem. 
On the right, you can see that the company JPSN in 2018 has been able to save close to $2 billion uh, optimizing this problem for airline company in the US. So this example show you first, a kind of problem, but second, the fact that if we optimize the problem, we can save money, a lot of money. And this is important for company, as you know. The second problem is what is called the scaffolding. In the scaffolding, you have what is called Conti, is a small portion of the genome, which is obtained through experiment. So this is the first phase. And the second phase, people want to construct the genome, not from experiment, but now using computers. So this is the scaffolding problem. It's a combinatorial problem also because uh, using contigs, which are portion of the genome, the number of combination that you can make is huge. And among these combinations, there are just a few or one that is that correspond to what you want. So you have to explore those combinations and get the correct genome. So this is an important problem also in genomics and uh, bioinformatics. Another problem is the bean packing. In the bean packing, you have a certain number of items with volumes. It can be weights also. And you have a finite number of beans or containers. So the bean packing problem is how to range those items into a minimal number of beans. So you have to reduce the number of beans or container if you want. So here on the left, you can see uh, the mathematical programming model for this problem. And on the right, you have a, a, a picture who show a configuration this has a lot of application. For instance, if you have people that has to enter into a certain number of buses to go somewhere, so you want to minimize the number of buses. You, the same, you can have a lot of uh, things to pack into container. For instance, if you want to ship by boat. So you want to minimize the number of container because uh, the price you are going to pay is just proportional to the number of container. So this problem is very important, usual, and also it can help to save a lot of money for shipping companies. Another problem, the last for this slide, is called the stable marriage problem. Well, I know that marriage is already difficult, even if it's not combinatorial, but <laughs> it's too difficult. We all know about this. But here, it's not just to live together, but the marriage here is just a matching. So we want to see how to match people correctly according to their preference. So you have a set of people on one hand, another set of people on another hand, and each individual from both sides has to give his preference. Then the matching problem is to find uh, a pairing which correspond, which respects the preference. So this problem is also important. For instance, one possible application is you have a group of people uh, somewhere and you have a group of a set of rooms. So each people will say, okay, I can live with uh, Ricardo or uh, Edvandro and so on and so on. Then you have to put people into the rooms so as to respect uh, the compatibility that was uh, expressed in their preferences. So this problem is also interesting and has a lot of application. Uh, all those four problems that I show as example are interesting problem because they has a lot of application. And from the computing point of view, all those problems are called NP-hard problems. So they are difficult to solve, it's difficult in terms of the number of operations that you need to get uh, an optimal solution or an acceptable solution. Okay, so this gives you, let's say, an overview of uh, combinatorial optimization problem. There are more. Okay, so uh, why do we need a speed? This is important because you can say, okay, 
we have a combinatorial optimization from problem, but why do we need to, to solve them fast? Uh, the first answer is maybe the instance that you want to solve is a large scale one. So see if uh, the, inst the problem itself is already difficult in terms of complexity. Imagine if you have to solve a large scale one. So um, sometimes we will see it later. A uh, problem might require century to be solved. So this is unaffordable for a human life. So that's why we really need to find a way to go as fast as possible, okay? The second reason is when you are solving a combinatorial optimization problem, sometimes it's just a sub problem of a more larger problem. And since it's a sub problem, you have to solve it several times with different configuration of the inputs. And so in order to be able to solve all the possible configuration of the inputs, you have to be able to solve one instance at the fastest. Another uh, explanation is that the configuration might change every time. So we have to run again the solver. If you consider, for instance, the case of the crew pairing, you can say, okay, we can solve the crew pairing problem one time for the whole year and then just use it every day. Yes, this is possible. But the problem is that, for instance, you had the COVID, some flight has canceled, impossible. So the configuration that you had at the beginning is no longer valid. You have to rerun again your solver to find the best configuration at the time that you are considering the problem. And so uh, the argument that some problem can be solved one time for a long period is not valid because the situation can change. And the case of the crew pairing is very interesting, especially with the case of the COVID where the airline company are very perturbated. Another reason is a lot of combinatorial problems are related to real life issues. So um, we don't have time, especially nowadays that we are very impatient. Uh, so those combinatorial problems, sometimes we don't even know that behind the application that we are using, there is a combinatorial problem behind. For instance, when you are inside your car using your GPS, then you lost your way. What the GPS has to do? The GPS has to recompute the best path from where you are until where you are going. And this has to be done quickly because you don't have the time to stay on the road waiting for your GPS to provide another route for you. And so real-time processing for real life application is also a strong motivation uh, for having uh, fast processing for combinatorial optimization uh, problems. So I got this uh, on the internet. So this phrase and is very interesting. In the future, as our technology continues to improve and complexify, the ability to solve difficult problems of immense scale is likely to be in much higher demand and will require breakthrough in optimization algorithms. So this corresponds to what I say in the last uh, argument of this slide. Okay, this is a specific example, which is interesting to focus on. It's called the traveling salesman problem. Uh, you have a certain number of points, let's say for instance, cities. Each city is connected to a certain number of cities. So this yield a graph. From this graph, you have to build what is called a tour. A tour is just <clears throat> a cycle in the graph which contains all the nodes of the graph. This is very important also. For instance, if you have to collect uh, things among houses in a, in a city, then you don't want to pass through the same house several times. So you need to have a tool 
who will allow you to collect all what you need to collect from all the houses that are involved, passing through every house one time, once. <laughs> so this is a mathematical programming uh, formulation of this problem, but it's a problem that has a strong complexity factorial. So for instance, if you just, for this problem, if you have to solve it for with 25 nodes or cities, using the fastest supercomputer in the world, then you need 25 years of calculation. This is unaffordable, just 25 cities, imagine this. Uh, it's interesting to know that three guys, Applegate, Bixby and Schwartal, you know Bixby is the one who has the society log who was doing uh, CPLEX. So uh, they were able to solve <clears throat> the problem with more than 85,000 cities in one year and a half. You will say, okay, one year and a half is too much, but please remember that I saw that with just 25 cities, you need 25 years, but they were able to solve with 85,000 in just one year and a half. Using a small cluster of computer, a small, very small cluster of 95 uh, cluster uh, processor of 2.8 gigahertz. And so uh, you can ask yourself, but how is it possible? The answer is <clears throat> the method that they use to solve the problem. Very sophisticated combinatorial optimization method. But you still have 1.5 years, it's too much but it's a big success. So for me, starting from this 1.5 years, now people from HPC has to take it and then bring it maybe for hours of computation. And this is a possible. So there is a combination to solve biggest computer, uh, combinatorial optimization problem between methods and parallel computing. What are the existing methods that are sometimes considered to solve a combinatorial problem? The first one is ad hoc algorithm. So you solve it as you, as you want. Brute force is a possibility. So you just explore all the possibilities and take the best. You can have intuitive notion, then you get an algorithm or using the common sense. So this works also. Another possibility is using what is called Grady algorithm. It's a paradigm where you build your solution step by step, starting with an empty set and populate it step by step. And at each step, you choose the best candidate. That's why it's called Grady algorithm. Uh, another paradigm is called dynamic programming. It's very well-known paradigm which also help to construct the solution uh, starting from, uh, let's say it's a top-down solution. So you start with uh, a bigger solution and then you go through a specific solution by um, updating the, the special parameter. You also have approximation algorithms. Uh, sometimes your problem is so complicated that you cannot solve it exactly. And then you go with approximation. And I wanted to say that sometimes we don't even need an exact solution. We can live with an approximated solution. So approximated, approximation algorithms are also a way to go. Genetic algorithms are also an interesting paradigm that is used to solve combinatorial optimization problems. A uh, genetic algorithm, let's say you explore the, what is called the search space using um, genomic likes operation, like crossing over mutation, things like that. So this paradigm is similar to um, genomics activities. You have the branch and bound. This is the most popular among those who are um, specialist in 
combinatorial optimization because it's a good mix of continuous optimization and discrete optimization. Uh, the techniques is uh, what we will see it later. So you just use continuous optimization to solve the solve problem, use the information uh, about the result of the solve problem to decide where to go or if some possibility are completely, um, should be eliminated because you already know that you cannot get anything from, from there. So mathematical programming is a way to formulate uh, combinatorial problems or continuous problem also and solve them through uh, domain components that are the objective function and the constraints. You also have artificial intelligence. Yes, because if you consider, for instance, uh, games like chess, uh, nowadays, a lot of people give a strong consideration to artificial intelligence approaches. So these are, let's say, the major methods or approaches to solve uh, combinatorial uh, problems. OK. Let's consider a specific case of the knapsack problem. The knapsack problem is you are given a bag with a limit. This limit, that limit can be the weight that you can carry on. And you are a certain number of items that you have to put into your bag. So you know that you are constrained about the weight, the total weight of what you can put inside the bag. It can be also the volume. So the, your um, objective here is to minimize the value of the, no, the, the item that you succeed put into the bag. In this case, your bag can hold a maximum of 15 kilograms. So the question will be how or which item I will choose to put into the bag, not exceeding the 15 kilograms, this is a constraint, in such a way that the value, the total value of the item, you can see that each value has a val uh, each item has a value in dollars. So I want to maximize uh, the, the value of the item in the bag. So this is called the, the knapsack problem. It's a variant of the knapsack problem. This table show um, <clears throat> a complexity of a certain variants of the problem, but these complexity are the complexity of approximation algorithms. As you can see, all those complexity are over epsilon, epsilon square, epsilon to the power of three. But in any case, you can see that if epsilon is going close to zero, but we not need zero, then your complexity is going to infinite. You don't need zero because most of the time you are working with discrete function. So even with epsilon equal to one, you will have an exact solution because you are working with integers. So in any case, you can see that the epsilon is, uh, is down. So each time epsilon is small, your complexity increase. So this is uh, an interesting point, an important point with approximation algorithm. The more you want a precise solution, the more you pay for the computation, okay? That's why we need also to, to parallelize at the best uh, approximation algorithm, even if they can provide an acceptable solution in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, now let's have a look on the recent top ranking of the supercomputer because we have so far talking about um, using supercomputer or parallelizing uh, combinatorial optimization uh, algorithm. So I just take five of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. This is the June, uh, the most recent ranking. Well, you can see that you have a serious um, peak. So the computing power is tremendous, but you can see that even running um, linear algebra application that are, let's say, easy because there is no much waste of uh, computing um, uh, power, 
you have a percentage of 80, 70, things like that, even 60 for the, uh, the, the last one, which is not too much. So if using a gentle application, because this is what is used for the, this ranking, it's a linear algebra application. You get, for instance, for the Tianhe machine, the, the five one, 60% of the, the, the peak performance, which is the power, the theoretical power that the machine can give to you. Imagine what will happen with a combinatorial optimization algorithm, which are highly irregular. So uh, the problem is, or the conclusion of here is, even if we have strong, very powerful supercomputer, the sustained performance that we can get with those supercomputer on combinatorial optimization algorithm will be unfortunately very low. So it's worth doing a lot of effort to parallelize those algorithms in the most efficient way, so as to benefit from the available power on uh, the supercomputer. Uh, let's talk roughly about the parallelization approach. One way to parallelize combinatorial optimization algorithm is just to consider the parallelism that is inherent to the paradigm itself. For instance, if the method like the branch and bound suggest to explore several direction. If you are considering a sequential algorithm, then you are going to explore each direction at a time. But if you are using or considering a parallel computation, and then you can just explore all the direction in parallel. So that's why I say that one possibility to parallelize a combinatorial optimization is just to follow the parallelism that is inherent to the method itself. The second possibility, depending on the algorithm or the method, is to parallelize the main component. Because uh, when you have a method to solve a combinatorial problem, in general, it's a, it's a succession of method. You have a flow of method of kernels. So one way should be to parallelize each step. So for instance, if you are using um, uh, convex optimization, then you have to compute the derivatives. Then if you are using relaxation, then you have to solve the problem and solve the associated problem, combinate the solution to get an approximation solution. So you have a lot of steps. So for me, you can parallelize each step. So it's like what is called locally parallel, globally sequential. Another way is just to do a globally parallel, locally sequential, which means that you parallelize the steps. So all the steps are done in parallel, but each step can be done in sequential or both. So you can do parallelism inside each steps and parallelism among the steps. Uh, this way is more complicated because if you are going to parallelize the steps, you are probably uh, going to deal with a lot of synchronization because one step might be waiting for the result of another step to know where to go or which decision to take. But it's a way to go. Another classical way, let's say, it's what is called a domain decomposition. So uh, the, the space on which you are working or searching, you just cluster it and solve the problem with each cluster in parallel. So this is very used uh, to solve not only combinatorial optimization problem, but even numerical problem, but it can also be applied on um, parallel combinatorial optimization. 
Uh, another method which is used to parallelize the source code. So regardless of the algorithm behind. So you just have a code which is sequential and you want to derive a parallel version of that code using, uh, let's say, um, transformation techniques. So you transform the code from sequential to parallel. This applies to any kind of problem or topics. And I think that it can also be applied on combinatorial optimization algorithm, as I will show you later. And this is part of the work that I recently uh, did. Uh, what is the branch unbound? This is just, I will give you a rough idea, for instance. So you can see here, you have an optimization problem, okay? Uh, if you take the feasible solution at the point that are in uh, black, the optimum solution, you can see it is rounded with this, a circle in red. But if you solve, you just say, okay, um, instead of solving my problem, considering that the variable are integer, I'm just going to solve it, considering that my variable are continuous. Then when the variable are discrete, then you are solving what is called mixed integer programming or integer programming. And when the variable are continuous, then you are just solving a linear programming problem. In this picture, if you solve the linear programming problem, then you are going to get a solution which in this picture is close to your optimum, but it is not, okay? And so what the branch and bound will do? The branch and bound will start with a linear programming solution provided by the continuous form of the problem, which is called relaxation. And then you will get this point that you can see and on your right called optimum of LP relaxation. Then when you got it, you cut your space into two. Here we cut it using an horizontal line from the optimum of LP relaxation. Then now we have two pieces, one on top and one down. So the branch and bound will suggest to explore each pieces. And sometimes one piece might be uh, useless, but this is roughly the idea of the branch and bound, okay? So this is just uh, a picture to show you how, when the branch and bound is running, how it looks like. It's not always a binary branch and bound. You can have more branches from a given node. So a practical instance of discrete optimization problem are better solved through a skillful combination of continuous optimization techniques and branch and bound like mechanism. This means that uh, in general, people are likely to follow the branch and bound paradigm. But at each node, I said, for instance, in the example, a previous example that we are going to solve a linear programming problem, but it can be anything else. So this is very important in optimization because uh, this approach create a bridge between continuous optimization and discrete optimization. So both, the, both are merged uh, to provide a powerful method to tackle complicated combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, so now, considering that the branch and bound is a very popular method, what are the scalability issues? Because as I said, when uh, displaying the list of supercomputer, one problem with parallel computing is not just parallelize the problem, no, is to get what is called an efficient parallelization. And an efficient parallelization, one way to measure it is to measure the speed up according to the number of processors that you have used. So if I have been using 20 processors, 
And then I can expect a speed up in theory of 20. But if I got 18, 16, then that's the inefficient parallelization. But if I got just four, then this is not an efficient parallelization because I was able to accelerate my computation by factor four using 20 processors. And so this is called scalability. And then for the branch and band, what are the issues on the way of scalability? The first issue is load imbalance. Is load imbalance because what you will say is I will allocate each processor for each branch of my branch and bound. But the problem is some branch will be pruned because uh, technically we know that there is no thing to get from that branch. Then the processor will be idle because he was assigned that branch, but your techniques shows that that branch is not going to bring anything. So load imbalance is a common problem uh, when parallelizing a branch and bound uh, scheme. Synchronization also is something you have to take care. Of. And unfortunately, synchronization means that some processor will wait for the others. And this also occur in a branch and bound method because you have to wait for the solution of the sub problems and to decide if you already get the solution and then stops everything, or if you have to go further and where to go. So this is a synchronization point. And synchronization means waiting. And waiting means wasting of time. And in parallel computing, this means also losing scalability. Another problem is concurrent and irregular memory accesses. You can see that when you are using a branch and bound, you are going from left to right or even more. On computer, the memory is not like that. Going from left to right might, might uh, imply a big jump on memory. If you are using, for instance, a NUMA processor, which has a lot of cores, and then jumping like this probably will send you from one local memory to another distant local memory. And this is a killing for, uh, for scalability. And unfortunately, uh, in using a branch and bound, this is something awaiting for uh, the programmers. If you are using uh, a distributed memory parallel machine where the data are exchanges through the network among the processor or the nodes. And then using the branch and bound, you are going also to experience a lot of data exchange because all the information that you grab from solving sub problems has to be exchanges among the, the computing node to take a global decision. And when a global decision has to be taken. Probably you are going to assign uh, this global decision management to one processor. So that processor has to collect the information from all the other processors to calculate an information that will help to take a global decision. So you have a lot of irregular data exchange if you are using uh, a distributed memory parallel machine. So this is another bottleneck when you are considering a parallel a branch and bound. Another point, the last for this side, is resource sharing. Um, when you are solving a branch parallel branch and, the branch and bound in parallel, as I said, you have to exchange, you have to share the information. For instance, if your sub problems, the problem at a node, are linear programming problems, for instance, then what people used to do is uh, the gradient of your objective function that was calculated so far has to be stored and taken into account when solving any other instance of the sub problem. So, in general, what people do, 
they have a repository of the gradient computed so far. And that repository exists in one. So there is only one repository where all the gradients are stored. Then all the processors at each time they are going to solve a sub problem. They are going to go into that repository to take the information about the previous gradients. So you have all the processors going into the same place to take information, for instance, about the gradients. So there will be a racing on the memory related to that uh, um, repository. And this is also a killing about the scalability. The last point is the weak scalability of the problem on the, uh, on the node, which means that even if you are doing well globally with your grant amount, maybe the way you are solving the soap problem at a local node is not as efficient as possible. And then you are suffering from a global unscalability because of a local unscalability. Okay, now uh, I'm just going to give you an overview of my recent research about how to parallelize two of the previous paradigms that I uh, explained to you, dynamic programming and Grady algorithm. Here, the motivation is that dynamic programming and Grady algorithm are very, very, very popular to solve combinatorial problems. Uh, so in general, we end up with a code that solve our problem. Then from that code, the, problem, the question is, how are we going to parallelize it? So we already have a method and a code running. The problem is just a matter of execution time. So here, uh, I've considered shared memory parallelism using OpenMP. So this is the most common that every ordinary computer scientist can do. So I wanted to help those ordinary scientists uh, to be able to get or to reach an interesting parallel program that solve a combinatorial problem. Okay, uh, dynamical programming, as I said before, is uh, an iterative approach where the solution is constructed from an initial configuration to the final one in a recursive way. So this is um, a generic form of writing this iteration. So it's common to consider in-place computation to have a an interesting dynamic programming uh, scheme. What does it mean? It means that from one step to another, I don't change the memory location. I use the same memory location all the time. So the input, for the previous cell, uh, step, I used to compute the output for the next step. But since we are going to use the same memory location, we are going to store the output where the input were stored. This is called in-place computation. And this is very important because otherwise you are going to explode the memory if you are going to store the, 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 the information for each step on a different location. But uh, using an in-place computation is also interesting for performance because the address are already on the cache. Since you are using the same address all the time for the input and the output, then there is chance to have a fast uh, program because access to the memory is optimal. Um, the procedure in general works by means of iterative updates. So what I called computing the output from the input is just an update. You can see it as an update. I update my data uh, to reflect the state of the next step. This is an overview of five cases, the shortest path, uh, the dynamic programming for the shortest path, one of the well most known is due to Floyd Warshall. So for each of those algorithms, so you have the name, but you have the generic update, which means what is the operation that we do 
on the input to get the output in the same place. So this is a table that show five problem and on your right, on the column, right column, you have the, the, the update operation. So uh, for the shortest path, this is uh, the program that you can write directly using the washout flow algorithm. It's a very simple program. I, mean, I say simple because you just have uh, a tree nest loop and just one instruction. And this is sufficient to compute the shortest path in the graph. Then you want to parallelize it. Okay, if I'm using OpenMP on a shared memory machine, one way will be to just put a pragma as I did here. Pragma OMP parallel four, and then G here is private, okay? So when I do it, as I say here, a direct parallelization of the object is valid here. Why is it valid as I wrote it? Because the only dependence are the pivot. If you look at the instruction, you, you see that the dependence are just located on the K indices. And from one step to another, only the pivot row and column are invariant. So they don't change from one step to the other. So even if we are going to erase uh, the pivot column or the row column, when computing the next step, this will not be a problem because as I said, the pivot row and the pivot column will not change. So we use this information uh, to show that our parallelization is valid. Otherwise it will not be the case. And so uh, pivot sharing is a good point, especially with uh, an efficient uh, shared memory cache protocol because um, since the pivot has to be used by all the other core, it will remain on the cache and all the core will just go into that same cache. And most of a uh, shared memory um, uh, processor nowadays has a mechanism to share the data into the cache. So even if <clears throat> one processor has a data on is what we call its own cache, the other processor don't need to go on the main memory, but they can directly request the data from the cache of another processor. So here, since the pivot row and the pivot column are shared, even if one processor own it in its cache, the other will directly get it from there. And so another example is the, what is called the white flooding uh, uh, on, on a graph. So this is flooding is like, it's just like um, flooding using hydrostatic principle. So this is a, an algorithm from uh, Berge, which was a very um, talented guy in graph theory. So this is also an iterative algorithm following a dynamic programming uh, scheme. Again, here, a direct parallelization of the update is valid because there is no dependence in study step which means that you will parallelize a step here. You will fully parallelize a step because each step of this algorithm is embarrassingly parallel. So there is no specific effort. So here in this case, what you will have to do will be, as I said at the beginning, you will parallelize each step, but not from one step to another. So this is the code. So as you see, I just put one pragma OMP on top of the of the, the while loop. The while loop here is the loop of the iteration because we have to iterate until what is called uh, it important. So using the Berge theory for this problem, we have to compute all, until there is no change from one set to another, then we stop. So this is what the main loop control. It control if there was a change or not. So the second loop down here, just check if from the what we have computed with what we had before, there was a change or not. If it's not, and then we stop the algorithm. And if there has been a change, then we continue the algorithm. 
But the main computation is uh, the, the for loop, the, pre, the, the, the first for loop. And so we just have to put a pragma OMP4 and put G as private because it's a variable that is used for from one step to another, the G variable here. Uh, let's reconsider the knapsack. I already explained the knapsack. Here is the code to solve the knapsack. So uh, I'm not going to enter into the details, but we have a loop here that compute the knapsack. And then we analyze the loop. We see that all the, de the dependents are of that form, okay? So from IG, we go to I minus one, J minus lambda. You can see it from the code. The lambda here is W of I. Uh, so um, if you want to parallelize it, the computation along the E axis can be freely parallelized because there is uh, no specific dependence along this axis. And the <clears throat> one step lifetime of uh, line E suggests that we can do what is called array compression, which means that <clears throat> instead of allocating a new memory to solve all the steps, we can just use alternatively two array to solve one step, the next one, and the third one, we stop it at the location of the first one and so on. That's why we have this I modulo two. This is called array compression. So step zero will be stored at location zero, step one at location one, step two at location zero, step three at location one and so on. So just two locations are needed to store all the step of the dynamic programming here. So this array compression is very interesting also because when you are parallelizing uh, an application on a shared memory mach machine, always have in mind that the scalability of your program will not just depend on the fact that your program is parallel. No, as I said, sharing the resource can be an issue. So if you are using a big memory, and then you have chance to have a lot of cache misses. So when compressing the memory as I'm doing here with the modulo two, I am using less memory so maybe there is a chance that everything will fit into the cache. And this will help to have a more efficient parallelization and in general, a more efficient program when considering uh, the peak performance of the processor. So this is the code of the knapsack and this is uh, the, the parallel um, Pragma, OMP Pragma to parallelize the, the main loop, okay? And you can see the modulo two here. This is just for the memory compression, as I explained. There is another problem, which is called the long common subsequence problem. So this problem is just to find the longest common contiguous subsequence given two finite sequence. This problem is very used um, to compare two a string, you know the interesting algorithm of uh, Karp, Miller, and Winograd, the Knut, sorry, the KMP algorithm, which was for this problem. And it's also used in genomics to find the longest common part between two genomes. So uh, one algorithm to solve it using dynamic programming, use the steps as described in the, in the in this slide, okay? So from this updates, then this is the code. Really simple, just two loops, okay? Then this is the loops to solve the longest common subsequence following um, uh, this algorithm, this dynamic programming algorithm. And so from there, the question is, how are we going to parallelize this? Okay, look at the dependence. The only dependence that we have here, or the main one, the first one after the if instruction is IG depend on I minus one, J minus one. Okay. And then um, if you consider the other dependence, the second one, 
we are going to apply what is called loop skewing. This is a geometrical transformation because if you look at the second uh, instruction uh, after the else, then you see that the dependence is along i and along j also. So to solve this problem, because you have the dependence in both directions, which block the parallelization, because um, when there is a dependence in one direction, you cannot parallelize that direction. And here, for the else, we have the dependence in both directions, i and j. So one way to solve it is do what is called loop skewing is a geometrical transformation uh, that help the, the, the computation having just one dependence in one direction. So when this is done, then you get this loop. In general, the loop scaling cut the loop into two parts. That's why you have two parts here. We go from two to N and then from N plus one to two, times n minus one. And each part, each loop is parallelized the same way. So for the first one, we have applied a loop skewing. And for the second one, we did the same, okay? So this was a way also to parallelize uh, the longest common subsequence uh, dynamical programming algorithm. So these are the performance that I got. You can see that um, for all the problems, we have acceptable speed ups, okay? Even with eight processors, we have seven, a speed up of seven, which is very interesting, or six. Uh, from the longest um, subsequence, the speed up is not good. This is because this problem is not really parallel by itself. So this was the best that we were able to get. And this is because of the problem itself. Um, so this for the grading algorithm, these are the performance also that we got. We can see that the speed up are also interesting. From eight, we can also have six, five, if we consider, okay, so this, and this end my talks. So if you have question or remark, I'm free to answer. Claude, thank you very much. This was a very nice uh, presentation on uh, optimization algorithms. I like it very much. Uh, let me see. Well, people are complimenting you on the chat. Thank you. Your talk was very good, very didactical. And I don't know if they have any questions in YouTube, Viterbo. Do you have any questions in YouTube? I don't know. I think we have time for one quick question because we are running out of time. There's another session right now. Okay. I have one question for you, Claude. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever heard about a uh, programming language called Julia? Yes, but I never use it. Okay, I use it for combinatorial optimization. And actually they have dynamic parallelism with uh, a runtime system load balancing strategy, mm. which would be very nice for branch and bound because you, you only create the thread if mm -hmm. you are actually running it. So you don't need to create before all the threads and etc. So I think maybe it will be very nice to implement. Ah, okay. So the load imbalance is managed directly by the, by the Yeah, do you, have you heard about the Silk language? Yes. From MIT? Yeah, it's yeah. similar to Silk. Okay. It's a similar uh, implementation. Uh, probably they, they got, because yeah, this, they this language the, was proposed from MIT too. So mm. probably they got, the, the idea of Silk in mm. providing loading, load balancing by the runtime system. And it's very interesting for the optimization area. It's really interesting. Ah, okay, nice. This is something. Okay, to... let me see if someone wrote. Oh, someone is commenting that you, you put the wrong ear on your slides. 
in 2019, which is good because we want to forget 2020, right? <laughs> where, where? Ah, on, on the, your the... slides. Oh, on your oh. slides. <laughs> it's good. We want to forget this year. <laughs> So okay. it's 2019 or 2021, 2020, we can 2020, forget. yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and okay, people are congratulating you. And I have to, I have to stop now because we have another okay. session. Um, okay, thank right you now. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have a nice uh, continuation of the workshop. Thank you very much, Claude. You are our international guest. And we are very Pleasure. lucky to have you here, your presentation, to be collaborating with you. Okay. And it was a very good presentation. Yeah, a lot of compliments. Look at the chat and you're going to see. <laughs> no, I, I'm lucky. Sorte minha. Sorte. So let me see here in the email. We have another session now. Okay, uh, so I stop sharing my screen, okay? Yeah, okay. Then okay. the next session will start now. We would have a break, but maybe we don't have a break. But it no. will start on Google Meetings. And this they will present uh, post-graduation um, okay. work on okay. cloud computing. So uh, we can leave this Zoom okay. meeting now. Okay. Okay, no, that's a question. There's a question, Claude. Mm -hmm. uh, can we tackle a distributed dynamic program in the same way? Which, the same way? Um, no, 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 because uh, you have to consider um, data exchanges. And this is more difficult to do automatically because the semantic of data exchange is hard to handle using automatic transformation. There are some people who try to do it, but not necessarily for, um, dyna for dynamic programming or combinatorial optimization. And I, we had one PhD student that I, in, uh, in our laboratory that was trying to do this and it was very difficult. I guess that the uh, reason, as I said, the semantic of exchanging the data is very hard to handle at the syntactic point uh, level. This is Lucia's question. So again, Claude, thank you very much for your thank talk. Thank you, Claude. <laughs> okay, Lucia. Thank you, Claude. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank like you. To have bye -bye. you bye -bye. with us here. Yeah. Yeah. And it was very good. I think the students will take advantage of this nice presentation. Okay, thank you. I can give you the slide too. Okay. Bye -bye. So, bye-bye.